everyone, welcome back to our Virago build series. This is episode 2 where we'll be covering the engine teardown. This episode is poised to be a very relaxed and focused one. Not much exposition or fancy stuff, just simply watch as I take an engine apart. But before all that, check it out. Vermont came through with the plate. It arrived on November 9th, which means the process from mail out to mail in took about 5 weeks. If you remember, I wrote a check for $111, which means that I overpaid by a little bit, you know, by whatever number that Vermont put for the sales tax. I don't really know how they got a lesser number for the NADA value, but whatever. You know what, better safe than sorry. Consider the 15 bucks a tip and a thank you. The actual registration sticker should arrive uh, probably next month by all accounts, but with this plate, the Virago frame is now legal and ready to be modified, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, the engine disassembly. I began on a rather dreary October 27th, early in the morning. I've never taken apart a V-twin before, so I had the service manual ready on the side for some guidance. I started by immediately skipping step one and leaving the gear change pedal on the engine because what are you going to do about it? Step 2. Remove the front motor mount. I had some issues fitting the electric impact on there so I just used the poor man's version, a wrench and a rubber mallet. Works just the same. Next up were the external oil lines, the cam chain tensioners, the cam covers and sprockets, and the uh, spark plugs. These hard lines feed oil to the top ends of the engine. It's a very simple design when you couple it with the lack of liquid cooling. By the way, I'm sorting cylinder specific parts in this divider bin so everything stays together for reassembly. Some people use cylinder 1 and 2 terms, but I prefer front and rear as you'll never really confuse them. Anything shared just goes in this milk crate for now. Spark plugs are simple enough, I had them in there loose so they actually came out by hand. Next were the cam covers. I have to say, working on a V-twin is interesting because you're basically doing everything twice, which I reckon equals twice the experience points towards your level up. As far as filming goes, you have two chances to get the shot too, maybe with one of them being like a learning experience, which I will soon demonstrate. Now here's something weird. The manual says that the oil baffle plate is only on the rear cylinder, and it even shows you a photo of what it looks like here. Now on my engine, I didn't notice it left behind on the rear cylinder, but I did notice this grey metal thing inside the cam cover that could be it, but that doesn't make sense. Because look, here's the front cylinder cam cover and that gray metal thing is absent and what looks like the pictured, ba the pictured baffle is still bolted on the camshaft at the front cylinder. So, well, I mean it's weird, but maybe the book meant front cylinder instead of rear cylinder. But anyway, let's just get the bolt, the baffle, the sprocket off the front cylinder and the rear. This is the retainer for the camshaft bushing. I removed each one. The bushing and camshaft all come out as one using the bolt to give them a quick yank. Just FYI, these uh, solid bushings can be upgraded to a roller bearing style to offer a much smoother operation and less wear. The cams didn't really look that good. They had scoring marks and burns. It wasn't really a fan. 
I am a fan of beer though. This video is not sponsored by Water Beer, Irish and Adele. Goes down a little sweet like caramel, but puts hair in your chest for any seized bolts. Makes you want to set things on fire. Okay, here's the first hurdle that I faced with the teardown, the rocker arm shafts. So basically on a CB550, you would throw the bolts in there, into the shafts, you know, pull them out with your hand, no tools necessary. On this, they were completely stuck in there. First attempt, the first attempt saw that I um, heated the aluminum head to try to expand it around a steel rocker arm shaft. Then I simply like took a bolt and tried to get it out of there by hand. Now the book recommends using a slide hammer, but I do not own one, and the nearby auto stores didn't have them either, so I had to get creative with it. Eventually I got both rocker shafts out of one cylinder off camera as I was learning how to do it. So now I'll show you how I did it on the second cylinder. It's really just a poor man's uh, puller tool. You know, it's just a bolt with a bunch of washers, nuts, and then a socket towards the end. You just thread the bolt into the rocker shaft and you add the hardware to the bolt as the shaft gets closer to you. Once it gets nearly out of the head, you just use a socket because it's wide enough to rest against the head, but it's hollow so it can have the shaft pass into it. Just watch as the rocker shaft becomes more and more visible in the slot as the hardware on the puller bolt gets changed out. Again, the socket allows the rocker shaft to leave because it's hollow. A nut or a washer would simply hit against it at this point and everything would just spin in place. Once it's out, you can remove the valve cover and push the rocker arm out the side as it no longer has a shaft to rock on. Same thing for the exhaust side. All right, now it's time to remove the heads, starting with the front cylinder. So you have four main head nuts, two Allen bolts on one side, and an acorn nut by the spark plug. The studs meant that um, I didn't have a deep a socket deep enough for the main head nuts, so once again, I had, uh, I had to use the even poorer man's impact wrench. You know, this time using a, a monkey wrench, AKA a nut rounder. <laughs> Pulling the head is just applying equal force all over it to break the seal caused by corrosion. Plus, uh, for, bi for vibration, um, Yamaha yeah, fitted like certain cylinders with rubber sleeves on the head studs, and a lot of times only one cylinder out of the two.
The cylinder walls didn't look like anything out of the ordinary, nor did the valves, you know, typical wear. I had a dummy moment because I didn't realize that on air-cooled V-twins with external oiling, the head gasket is literally just a metal ring. Like, it's not the typical graphite type that I was used to seeing. And I got kind of confused because, you know, how... Because the difficulty I experienced opening the engine up implies that it was never opened before, you know, since it was new. So how would there not be a head gasket? Yeah, no, the head gasket is just this little metal ring right here. Okay, the jugs are held in by three Allens. Next scary moment, the cylinder liner had these two notches in them that I thought <laughs> was damaged from, you know, maybe being struck by a connecting rod or something like that. You know, that's just how they come on these bikes. And now to repeat everything I just did on the rear cylinder. My camera did die before I was able to pull the jug off though. With the top ends of the engine removed, I switched my attention to the flywheel and the stator side of the engine, starting with the gear shifter and the cover. I made a cardboard template to store the hardware, which makes reinstallation super simple. This little dowel fell down the side, which I thought it, you know, which I thought I came from the um, behind the cover, but it's actually the locating dowel for the rear cylinder that came off when I took it off. So it was just kind of there, but when I moved the cover, it slid down. All right, this stack of gears is part of the notorious starter system of the Virago. So I put a zip tie through it, you know, just keep it all in order. Um, everything else stays bolted to the cover itself, so you can just move the cover to the side. Okay, here's the next hurdle the flywheel and rotor nut. By all accounts, this nut was put on there by Jesus himself and only the strongest of air tools can remove it. Our air compressor was broken and the air wrench was loaned out anyway, so I gave it a shot with the electric impact to no avail. It's okay though, I just moved the engine to the shed and I'll come back with the big guns. Anyway, we got the new air tools set up with the big 90 PSI half drive wrench. Blew that nut right off by pushing it to 115 PSI. It was raining and the engine was reasonably light now with all of the parts removed, so I wanted to move it inside for the rest of the teardown, you know, so I could be comfortable. I made sure that the oil was drained and I moved it inside. The next hurdle was pulling the flywheel and the rotor themselves. So you need to pull a tool kit which uses like a big threaded rod and a plate with a few smaller bolts. The rod pushes against the crank and pulls the smaller bolts that go, uh, that thread directly into the rotor. It's such a tough job that I actually broke one puller rod uh, tool and had to get another one. The annoying part is the fact that I screwed up filming popping this thing loose and I have no footage of it. So if you want actual advice on how to do that part, there's a channel called Steve's DIYs that explains it very, very well. So I'll link it in the description for you if you're actually, you know, doing a Virago yourself. At this point, it's just me sliding it off after the absolute battle that was getting it loose in the first place. It's really not fun. Okay, here's the oil pump stuff. It's driven off the crank by a chain. That one little Phillips or a JIS bolt, that just holds the pump together. There's no need to undo it if you're just taking it off. By the way, everything I removed is going into separate plastic bags to keep it all in order for reassembly. All right, next up, starter motor. Then we can focus on the clutch side of the engine.
This little cover on the right is the oil filter housing, which was already like broken at the top of one of the bolt holes. Same as the other side, I had a cardboard template for hardware. The cover was on there pretty good, so I had to use uh, some plastic trim removal tools, you know, for the interior of your car, as to not damage the gasket surfaces. You don't really want to use like metal, you want to use plastic or wood here. I suspect it was uh, the steel to aluminum corrosion on this particular stud that had everything kind of stuck together, not wanting to come apart. I made sure to keep all of the clutch plates in order and assembled as it, as it came out of the engine exactly. You know, I'm gonna replace the friction plates, but it doesn't hurt. It looks like a big robot hamburger. <laughs> okay, now for the big boy nut on the crank. You have to put a piece of cloth between the crank gear and the gear that drives the cam chain, as Viragos have a semi-gear driven cams. You need a 36 millimeter socket for it. The cam gear comes out alone, but uh, the other ones come out as an assembly, and you want to keep them together because they have springs and whatnot, you know, in between them. Next up was the oil level sensor. Not oil pressure, but oil level. For some reason they went with oil level. After that I took some time to clean up a little around the engine and remove the clutch push rod before I end up splitting the case in half. Alright, so there's a total of 19 bolts holding the case together. And Yamaha was kind enough to label them for you. So there's five on the clutch side of the engine and the rest are on the stator side after you get those five loose. You got three big Allen key ones on the top, and you have eight small ones that go around and on the bottom.
All right, is it me or, or does this part of the engine kind of look like, uh... Anyway, and then there's three small ones inside of the engine. After that, you're ready to pry the case in half. All right, so there's several pry points around the engine, mainly along the bottom. You can carefully use a flathead since the pry points are sort of extended beyond the gasket surface. Like, there's the gasket surface and then there's a little bit of metal beyond that where you could pry against it. Once it began to separate a little bit, I used those plastic trim tools to get further into the gasket surfaces and not damage them. And voila, the case splits in half. Okay, so the reason why I decided to split the case to begin with was to first and foremost avoid any bottom end leaks like the one I experienced on the CB550 when it's warm. I've never witnessed this bike running, so it would be due diligence to reseal everything on the engine rather than chance it again. Second, I wanted to get the engine vapor blasted, but upon speaking to a local blaster, I learned that I would have to strip the engine down completely to literally nothing, you know, even beyond this. And honestly, I refuse to push my luck that far. So what's next? Well, from here, I will check the uh, the rod bearings and the crank journals to make sure that everything looks good there. Um, you know, the cams kind of tell a bad story, but hopefully the bottom end is okay. Then after that, if everything's good, I'll just reseal the case together, prep it up, and apply the POR uh, aluminum paint kit that I have left over from the BMW. Some of you might remember that. You know, I want to do an aluminum and black color scheme on the engine, so perhaps like, you know, aluminum crank case, black engine covers, aluminum cylinders with black heads, and you know, anything black here is, is going to be powder coated black. You know, maybe shave fins on the head. In any case, I covered both halves of the case with plastic and I saved it for next episode. We'll start with the rod bearing check and go from there with the uh, reassembly and the, uh, the paint prep. If you have any questions about something that wasn't addressed, feel free to ask in the comment. In any case, you just watch the Illustrator. This is episode two of my Yamaha Virago XV920 build series and I will see you in the next one.